All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, Mehta, if you want to take on. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to 2020. Um, this is our first meeting for the year. So hope everyone had a fantastic break. Um, just to remind everyone, I mean, the meeting is recorded, so be careful what you say. <laughs> um, so, with regards to the agenda today, Can everybody see the screen now? Yeah. So yes, I'm gonna just kind of get everybody pivoted back to kind of where we were prior to Christmas. Remind people what what are some of the things that we have planned. Um, then we're gonna get an update from um, Alex and his team about what's going on on the in vitro screening front. Some of the plans there. Then. Um, What's interesting, the Charles River team had a discussion with Owen and they're starting to think of putting together a clinical development plan to go to the clinic and thought it would be good for the team to sort of share that with the group. You know, in an open science concept, I mean, it's a nice education for people as to how things advance from the clinical to clinical development. So some of that will be shared. Then um, Sue is going to give an update some of her chemistry. And then we're going to get an update from Jerome and some of the models he's thinking about that he has developed and some highlights from one of the papers he just actually submitted. So we're really looking forward to that. And lastly, if there's any major item, you know, we'll discuss that. Um, oops, can I see the top of the screen? So what I thought I'll do to start off is just, I mean, can I see the title? But basically, it's, since we got the extension, you know, from the, the granting agency, you know, I, see, uh, I mean, we got six months extension. I thought it would be nice to just put some goals up front for the short term six months. What are some of the things we like to achieve over that time frame? And so, one of the things we would like to actually accomplish very soon is to have all of the five leads, you know, fully scaled up for evaluation. We have done 2009, 2117, and we're waiting on one of the other CNS penitent, 12163, and then the two AMIs are a little bit delayed, but I'm hoping that we get all of those done within the next two to two, three months, have those ready. The next key thing, and that was one of the demands for granting the extension, is to really demonstrate that our lead inhibitors would show efficacy in a DIPG model, whether it's a sub Q or other topic. And so by June, they would actually like to see us come back to the table with some more information as to efficacy. So I thought that's a good target goal. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is, as we start thinking about the next phase of the project is the clinical development path, starting to the dog talks and rat, rat talks, and you're going to hear some of that from the route to the clinic plan. By so we're thinking of a grant and an NIH grant called the Therapeutics for Real Disease, got the IPG in the way. And so that program grant would hopefully fund and support some of the development plan for clinical selection. Um, in, in the meantime, you know, Charles River is working on identifying viable backups. And so, and then lastly, one of the things we had contemplated earlier in the project is again, PD marker. We thought we were gonna try this hep signing strategy that didn't look so promising. And I think it's coming full circle again. What would be an ideal PD marker? So I start looking around in the literature and I've just thrown some things up here for stimulating discussion. I thought I would sort of piggyback off of um, the ALK5 program from Lilly. I mean, they're all kind of the same pathway. And it's interesting from some digging. It looked like Lilly had used this phosphorus mad assay preclinically to actually help them map out PDs to assess kind of window, therapeutic window for talk. So I'm thinking that that might be something we can think about. Since if we know our compounds actually inhibit fossils, man, one and five in cells, what Lily used to do is they will take tumors from which they're getting efficacy, take those tumors and look at, you know, phosphorus mat in them. But in the clinic, they had the ability to look at peripheral blood. They'll dose for seven days, take blood, and actually look at diminution of um, phosphorus mat too. 
So I'm thinking that those might be some things we can think about in terms of as we do dose escalation, we can see if we are hitting the target and now we're getting the appropriate response in cells. So that's something to think about. The other thing that's going on with my toe is also a strategy where we can potentially label our ligands. We have a lot of methoxy groups in our, in our lead compounds. Some of those could be PET labeled, some of those methyl groups could be PET labeled. And then since it's one of the challenges with treating DIPG, I mean, it's echoing one of the things that Cynthia Hawkins said, that one of the reasons for a lot of the failures is a lot of the compounds don't actually get to the pun, which actually has a type of BBB. So a lot of the failures is attributed to that. So we thought this would be a good way if we label a compound, we can actually do a non-invasive imaging. Is the compound getting to the pond? And then you can actually look at this placement. You can do a nice dose response and you could see what therapeutic dose is getting complete displacement. So those are just some thoughts I'm throwing out, but things to think about as we assess how we're going to do PD analysis. Before you go on, just adding a couple of things. Your second point, evaluating the inhibitor as to the DIPG xenograph models by the number. So that, yes, that is part of the grant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we you know the, the grant had a box to tick to, to demonstrate the efficacy, and we will do that. But the other bigger part is there are other slightly different DIPG um, uh, in vivo models out there. Mm -hmm. And between now and June, it's not just to demonstrate, but it's also to evaluate yes. which model we're thinking about, which one has the greatest value. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah. You know, so we're going to do different models. We're going to uh, use. Uh, different parties to do this, and we're going to try and get an understanding of what is, is the most accurate. The next is the identify a viable backup compound. Just want to be a little clear here. We have five compounds that we have interest in that we want to move forward, and we're prepared to work with the NIH in their group if they still have funded small. Um, uh, it's not just looking at compounds, but to work with Charles River. They've been working on different series. Mm -hmm. and different, So it really is a different, not just the compounds, but the series. Yes. We want to do something that is you know, significantly yeah. different in case the series that we're using has some family characteristic that makes it non-therapeutic. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have them, if you and want to work with Sue and the team, I know they're on, we need to follow up with it but to continue work in a different direction from what this lead is because yes. in case the whole that goes down. Uh, last part on, on this, this is important, uh, the uh, the markers. Um, I would like to see or have discuss or frame it up either in this conversation or another, uh, what you think the plan for doing that is. And how do we decide and like a logical steps we plan because it may become part of what we do with the NIH as well yes. in that line, and I'd like to get embedded in there. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps in the next call, we mark out the plan for yeah. that and we go through there. Those are my comments. Thank you very much, Nathan, for yeah, being no problem. together. I mean, just to kind of echo, you were talking about the model. We'll actually have some of it highlighted on this next slide. So this slide was titled, actually, what are some of the current updates, like the actionable, current action. <laughs> So on the top, just to give you a little bit more granularity, so we have the five lead compounds we are scaling up. 2009 was complete. Just before Christmas, we got um, 2117 delivered, 45 grams of the ATL salts, and we have about 11 grams of the free base. So that's good. Now, um, 2163 was delayed. They had a little bit of hiccup, looked like, with some of the chemistry, so we're trying to get to the bottom of that. But hopefully we we are hoping to have some of that compound scale up very shortly. And then we are we had also mentioned just before Christmas because of one of the static material, two three four and two three six was going to be delayed, and the synthesis was supposed to start in 2020. Um, with regards to the DIPG efficacy model, actually just to echo what um, Owen was saying, so one of the things we're thinking of, so we have Chris Jones. Steve, we have Angle, and now we have Nader's group actually looking at models. So Chris Jones is exploring the orthotopic model, and I think they actually have um, tumors currently going, so they're going to be starting to dose 2009 in that model very, very soon. Um, remember, Angle had kindly done that nice experiment for us earlier on with 2009, and we identified hiccups with the vehicle. Now we've actually identified a better vehicle, which we think is going to be better tolerated. That's why we're making some of the eight sales salts of these. They're much more soluble. And so now we are discussing a plan to do now 2117 and 2163 in Angel's model, which is also another orthotopic model. 
What's also interesting is Nada's group in Montreal, she's not only looking at orthotropic models, but she's exploring some sub-Q models, and it looks like she's making some headway in terms of identifying some of these tumors that can go sub-Q. Now, to the point of the pity, if these tumors actually go sub-Q and they take, and we can show reduction of these tumors, then we can do some preclinical PD in those sub -Q tumors. We can take tumors after, if we see efficacy, take those and actually measure phosphorus max in those tumors. So that could actually help part of the PD. Yeah. So, so that's something we're thinking about too. So if we get nice efficacy, and um, NADA's group is kind of gearing up to start testing 2009 in two of the sub -Q models that she has been exploring right now. So we're going to be looking forward to that over the short term. Um, the next thing, we continue to actually access some of these DIPG lines. I mean, uh, Alex and his group is continue to look at some of the downstream biology of AL2, looking at, you know, uh, some of the mechanisms of inhibition of some of the inhibitors, apoptosis, cell cycle analysis, and stuff like that. And um, I think we continue with some of the protac efforts, but we're waiting for good antibodies to actually do some of the analysis. And like we mentioned earlier, looking for backups from the CRL effort, totally different series. Okay, and I just wanted to remind the team again, we have a no cost extension for this project in the preclinical stage until June. Okay, again, reminding the team, these are the five leads, but because of the CNS profile for the top three, those ones are sort of fast track, so, so that's important to keep that in mind. And then just continue to assess the competitive landscape. Nothing major has changed since after Christmas. So Toledo is the only company that's exploring an out to right now that I've seen in DIPG specifically. But we're kind of starting to get indications that the compound is not very selective. So a lot of the biology may not be related to out to. However, you've got Blueprint, BioQuiz, and Kiros. Those are companies going after FOP. So. I mean, you don't know when they're actually going to switch gears and start exploring the IPG depending on what they see. But right now, I don't see any small molecule out selective compounds that's in the clinic. So, so we're in a good place. Okay, so I think that's it for the update. If there are any questions, no burning questions in terms of um, what else is going to happen in the preclinical and clinical development plan. If not, we move right on to Alex. Presentation. Hi, Martin. Hi. This is your yep. group from um, Oxford. Pat, um, Pat yeah, sorry. You uh, a question? Uh, the experiments are currently still ongoing, so uh, we are just showing some uh, routine screening, uh, which was performed by Alison. And okay. these are a few of the compounds that we have recently received from Charles Rivers' lab. And out of them, uh, two are, um, one is really potent, and the other one, um, 3122, is uh, moderately potent. And these two, we are um, proceeding to test, uh, to test them in luciferase uh, assay for up to an as well as R5, whereas the other three compounds, they appear to be quite weak, and we will be pro um, proceeding further, further with them. And um, so, um, summarize here is just um, a list of some of the experiments that we are currently doing. Um, the good news is that we've managed to revive uh, one of the other DIPG patient derived cell lines, which is having up to R256G mutation. And we are planning to um, repeat the um, efficacy testing um, of some of the more um, promising M4K compounds in this additional uh, cell line, and potentially including some um, normal human neural uh, stem cell culture to just double check on the um, toxicity of the compounds. And um, in terms of the uh, more mechanistic as well as um, characterization of the M4K uh, lead compounds. We are currently checking to see uh, the effect of the compounds on the inhi inhibition of uh, SMART15 uh, phosphorylation in, in these um, DIPG cell lines. And also um, 
um, we are also performing some experiment to check um, the anti uh effect as well as uh, cytotoxic effect of this compound because um, we have observed that um, at earlier treatment time points, uh, most of these compounds are um, it reduces the proliferation of the cells and the cytotoxic effect uh, only set in much later on um, around day five or so. So yeah, these are the compound, uh, the experiment that we have uh, ongoing right uh, at the moment. And we should have the result for the uh, next meeting. Okay, this is Alex. Um, Ellie's uh, been very busy looking at the X-ray crystallography experiments. Um, she's deposited several structures um, for some of the M4K compounds bound out to. Um, probably you all have the PDB files beforehand, but uh, if not, we can send to you the PDB codes. Um, she's also been running more fragment screening against out to. Um, she's really optimized the conditions greatly, and she's done some XCHEM now with a mini fragment library. In the past, she's done some with the fragment library. Um, the mini fragments are developed by Aztecs, published recently, and pretty much all the single ring systems, all smaller fragments. Um, the library had about 84 compounds. I think she's collected data on about 81 of these. Um, for three, she never got the crystals to give uh, good diffraction. She's currently just refining those. She's already got some sort of half a dozen or so hits. Um, so she's currently looking at those to see the docking potents of the compounds. Um, we're also about to buy a Perkin Elmer assay kit of out to kinase activity, which hopefully can give us an assay in house in addition to the reaction biology screening. And this is an antibody that recognizes the phosphocerine or threonine or a peptide um, as a proper turnover assay rather than measuring ADP or something like that. Um, so we're hoping we could use that in future for any SAR. Um, so I think that's all from Oxford. Uh -huh. And also in terms of the uh, endogenous hacking of the ARC2 for the purpose of studying the effect of protect. Uh, for the degradation of the uh, R2 protein. Um, I've um, gotten some preliminary results and then um, I, I just need to proceed to uh, isolate like single cell, single colony of the cells with the uh, flag tag um, R2. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, Alex, with, you've, you identified a lot of Alice direct hits from your screen? Uh, yes. Mm, interesting. Okay, looking forward to where some of those might be binding. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions for Alex? Hi, this is Nicole. A quick question for Young Fu. The, the very potent compound in the nanobret assay looks interesting. Does that data track without two potency, or is that explained in a different way? Um, you, you mean the first uh, 3120? Yeah. 3120. Three one twenty. It's in my slides. Um, it's in my slides. Uh, it was pretty. It was the most active. Of so this is one of the compounds from the second blueprint patent. Mm -hmm. So that was. Um, it was the most potent of those. I, it was not three nanomoles. It's probably. I can't remember off the top of my head the number. Um, well, don't worry. See, we can come back to it later. Um, it's, it's just an interesting result. Anyway. Yeah. It sounds interesting to understand a bit about the structural biology of that compound, how it binds and what's contributing to the interaction strength. That's what I was thinking so, too, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we believe it obviously got the bidentate hinge interaction on the uh, Asia indole. So yeah. I thought that the night trial is probably in the, in the main... I, I did get uh, Sylvia to do some docking when we first started looking at this patent. And the nitrile looks to be in the same position as the, it's all sort of coming back to me now, sorry, um, <laughs> in the same position as the nitrile in the purity um, series where we've had a nitrile where the methyl usually is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those compounds tend to lose selectivity over ALK5, and that compound there, 3120, does lose selectivity over ALK5. Ah, uh, okay. So it's a lot more active on ALK5 
than most of the others. And you'll see in, it when, when we get to my slides um, that I've highlighted that as a, as a concern. Mm -hmm. well, hopefully very soon we'll tell you if that correlates in cells as well then without yeah, bias. Yeah, it'll be interesting, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it will, but we'll see. I'm oh, sure <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. If you have no other questions from Alex and his team, then we're going to switch over. Oops, sorry. There's a question. Here, why is that uh, 1.3, like 3, 1.3, the green one goes up, actually. The curve doesn't go down. You got that? Jean Fou, um, is that the question? Yeah, he's asking. Is that the question? Yeah, again, I was asking if you have any explanation for why that green compound is going up. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a result of the, um, it, if it has some um, effect on the activity on the uh, nanovisi phase itself, I suspect then it might create something, some weird effect as, as, as we observe here. Yeah, I think it's one of those quirks where the pro mega team who developed the assay would tell you instantly, oh, we've seen that a hundred times and it's this, but um, I guess we're a bit more in the dark. Yeah. It's an interfering compound. Yeah, that's why I'm saying structure. Yeah. 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 But we can't tell the fluorescence with that ring and then that yeah. the cycle, um, mm -hmm. that the period is feeding into that diverging system. Yeah. Might be causing interfering fluorescence. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for the update. Um, so we move on to the go to the clinic set of slides from the Charles River team. So is everybody there, sir? So. Yep, we're there. I'm Nicole. Okay. Speaking now. We're just missing um, Andy at the moment, but he should be he should be uh, joining us shortly. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Okay, next slide, please. So um, we had some discussions with Owen um, around what we should think about moving forward from where the project is now to reaching the clinic and the types of activities that we'll need to consider as a team. Um, and Sue and I have drafted in some additional colleagues from Charles River with expertise in, um, in different areas that contribute to that path through to the clinic. So what we're going to present today is um, thinking about the next steps for the project. So Matthew already showed we have five compounds, we're scaling those up. Those are late stage compounds now and we need to try and triage those down to one or two uh, more promising compounds that we would then profile through a candidate nomination package. And then after that we would choose one and take that through into the clinic and we need to build a package of data around that one compound preclinically to support those clinical studies and, and the regulators have some um, prerequisites for what we need to generate on those compounds um, in order to prove that the compound is safe and, and ready for clinic. So we pulled in it, some colleagues. Oh, sorry, Matthew, go ahead. Oh, actually, it was me. I just, uh, it's Owen. Uh, I just wanted to add one more bit to uh, uh, what I asked and what you very kindly did. The issue, one of the problems that I was having was uh, we put together a plan which was moving five compounds more or less in parallel, fairly deep down the cascade of decision making, mm -hmm. and ask the people, the team from Charles River, to look at the plan and to knowing the compounds, is there something that we can use early on to winnow down the five down to two or three quickly, so that we're not moving five compounds, we don't have the expense, we don't have the additional difficulty, is there something quick? And I think it's very important to, uh, to understand how they selected it and what they moved to the forefront because it was um, it was very thoughtful to me anyways. I wanted to pass that on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Go Thank ahead. You. We'll, we'll speak to that as we go through. Thank you. So we've got um, various sections to the presentation. We're going to pull in different experts from Charles River to talk to these. So key disciplines involved in this sort of next phase are going to be DMPK, safety assessment, um, pharmaceutical development and pharmacology. Um, the team have already started the scale up of the compounds, which will enable um, a lot of work to be done in this next phase. But obviously, that's a key thing as well to scale up the chemistry and, and develop the synthetic routes to support the clinical development. But we're not going to talk about that piece in these slides. We're just going to concentrate on the other four. So the first section is DMPK. So I'd just like to introduce Mike Briggs, who's um, sitting here with me today, and he's going to take you through the next couple of slides. 
Hi, so if we go to the next so if we go to the next slide then, please. So what I've got here on this summary slide in the next three slides is really an idea of the type of DMPK package that we would generate as we progress compounds through a screening cascade towards candidate nomination. And as a sort of bit of advice for the project team, what you will find is the closer that you get to candidate nomination, the more that your demands on DMPK as a resource will increase because effectively what we're trying to do is to try to de-risk the preclinical and eventually the clinical development of this compound as best we can as early as possible. But at the same time, we're trying to give ourselves confidence that the compound is going to have a clinical pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile that is going to support the target product profiles, whether that's sufficient for once a day dosing, twice a day dosing, and that we're going to achieve the right levels of unbound drug at the site of activity for long enough to support if efficacious endpoints. So the way we would do this, and it's, it's a similar approach that we'd use, you would use the screening cascade. So the four areas that we would look at, initially you're looking at in vitro characterization of a molecule. Now some of this data would have been generated as part of the usual screening through a, a screening cascade. But having had a look at the data pack that as a team we have here, there are some gaps that I think that we could backfill that may help rank these five compounds to whittle them down to maybe a, a lead two or three. Having got the in vitro characterization, obviously then the next step is to move into in vivo. What we're looking here is to generate pharmacokinetic understanding both in the pharmacology species, so you can get your PKPD, but importantly to have it in toxicology species such as the rat and the higher species like the dog. And that particular information can also help us to make predictions about likely human pharmacokinetics and dose. And at the end of the day, we're trying to find the compound that, as I've said, is going to meet that, that target product profile. Now, whereas all of these assays will be done as part of a screening cascade, if you've got five compounds in hand, what you can start to do then is to pick a number of these assays to put your five compounds in. And I would recommend in vitro, backfill some of the gaps in in vitro profile initially. And you're looking at, as you might expect, a better than, worse than profile. So is there any one or two compounds that are obviously better for specific reasons? And, you know, examples of things that you can de-risk on would be SIP inhibition, for example, if that hasn't been completed. I'm aware that we may not have a full understanding of the potential for PGP-mediated efflux. We have some nice CNS penetration profiles there in terms of brain to plasma ratio, but a ratio is not always a good way to rank compounds. What you really want to know is have an idea of the unbound concentration. So at the same time as measuring, for example, brain concentration, we should be measuring brain tissue binding and expressing that eventual concentration as an unbound drug level. Because my, my background history is in neurosciences. And many years ago, we, we used to rank compounds based on the bigger the brain to plasma ratio, the better. And it took us a while to learn. And we learned as the understanding of PKPD and free drug concentration became more important that effectively the higher your brain to plasma ratio, what's happening here is that you've, in fact, you've got higher nonspecific binding in the brain tissue. So it can work against you in terms of your eventual unbound brain concentration. So it, it would be important to get some of that brain tissue binding and brain levels. So as we move through the slides, go to the next slide. Yep, please. Please sit, go ahead. Would you, get, would you get answer the SIP? What were you commenting about doing more SIP? We had done SIP on all of the five compounds. We haven't done a lot of like mechanistic follow-up, like time-dependent sort of studies. So I don't know if that's what you were referring to. Or if you've, if you've got the SIP, that's, yeah, if you've got the SIP profiles to complete, that's fine. If you don't have any TDI, I, you might want to maybe in the first instance look at 3A4 as a, a particular screen because 3A4 is one of the SIPs where if you're going to get TDI, the majority of compounds do impact on that particular isoform. So mm -hmm. it's really backfilling for the project team to have a look at their data pack and see what you know gaps could be filled that would help differentiate between these five compounds. I think that's what you're looking to do now is to pick a lead out of these, these five that you can progress into your efficacy studies, for example. And obviously, based okay. on your intro, you can then move them into RAP K because I understand you have mouse PK, but the we, rat we also have, have rat. Yeah. But on the we also have form, PK. But do you do you have that on the final form of the compound that you may be progressing? 
and in a formulation suitable for toxicology studies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of formulation work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're the types of things. Thinking downstream, you, you may have used a certain vehicle in the pharmacology study that may not be appropriate for longer term tox. We may need to go back and have a look at the formulation and what the final salt form, for example, of a compound may be. So the following slides really just talk you through the types of studies that we would do for a typical candidate selection package. And they're broken down by in vitro assays, in vivo studies in rats or dogs, the PKPD approaches that we take, and eventually the, the human drug predictions, human dose predictions. So I don't know if you want to look at the slides, because I have highlighted where you could consider using some of these assays as a triaging step to try and reduce these compounds down from a five in the first instance. So for example, if you've done the SIP inhibition, maybe have a look at the TDI and 3A4 in the first instance. If you haven't got cross-species metabolic stability and all the compounds, that would be worth completing. Because it may raise a flag to suggest that one or two of the compounds may not have such good pharmacokinetics in toxicology species. And that may steer you towards picking a particular compound for progression. And the permeability PGP screen that I think is something that you could do with that data to try and understand or really minimize that risk of efflux and go for compounds with the minimum potential for PGP mediated efflux which is one active for the blood brain barrier and two quite often active in tumors more often than not. So that would help on both aspects there. And it's small compound needs. I, I hear that you're making up grams, but for these types of assays, you, you're really just making a 10 millimolar DMSO stock and then using that to feed the various, various assays. Some of them like plasma protein binding, you've got blood to plasma distribution. I wouldn't worry about at this point, that's not gonna be differentiating. It's more now, I think, reducing these five down to one or two. And then if we move on to the next slide, you have, this is basically in vivo. And I think here, really, I would focus on the rat as a means or as a model. You can't differentiate based on the in vitro DMPK profile. Move, move into the rat from an in vivo point of view. I just have a look at classic. Things like clearance volume, likely half-life in man, oral bioavailability, those types of questions. And evidence of dose escalation. If we're going forward into tox, if we increase the dose, do we see evidence of an increase in exposure, which is going to support the, the tox species? Compound demands go up a bit, but in a rat, not that bad. I mean, it, it's, it's tens of milligrams. It's only in the higher species, which we're not there yet. I think we, we need to get that one or two before we go into the higher. The higher species. Now I'll sort of finish there. Any, any questions? The other slides just talk about next steps like PKPD and clinical dose predictions, which is something we do as a general activity for a candidate nomination package. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Peter. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, far away. Yeah, sure. So listen, it's uh, great to hear that uh, you know you come from a background of uh, neuroscience. Um, obviously, it's very uh, important here. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, and, and also that you have, uh, you know, triage uh, steps along the way. So I, I'm just sort of on the top of the funnel, right, in terms of, you know, being able to uh, rule in or rule out compounds uh, right away. In your in vitro, you mentioned uh, several triaging assays. And, and I'm just curious, do you prioritize one or more over the others? And I, I say specifically, I asked about PGP. That uh, you know, take your point about tissue binding in in, in brain. But if there's a compound that is uh, you know uh, very much a PPP substrate, would, would you want to right away? I, w I would focus on the PGP. If I had to recommend one assay out of that in vitro, you know, package, I would go for that PGP assay in the first instance, just to give you confidence that compounds are distributing by passive processes, and therefore it's it's predictable what's likely to happen across the species and in that. Because once you start to get that transporter involvement, it, it's something we don't really understand how that translates into human and what the impact of that would be. So you would, you know, my recommendation would be do a better than worse than on permeability and PGP mediated efflux. And that's something that could be done as a batch of compounds here. We run this. We do have some data already, and um, did MDCK, we actually had done a nice study looking at, you know, 
looking at um, where you transfected the PGP in um, MDC Kessel. So we actually have a good feel for which compounds are likely to tend <laughs> towards more PGP. I mean, maybe we should share some more of that data with them. So I made up from our group and his, um, his student have done a really nice job of doing that profiling. So we have a very good feel of the PGP profiles for the leads. So you've got that data. I wasn't the data pack that I saw towards the end of last yeah. year. I, I, couldn't, I hadn't seen the PGP data. Because yeah. if you've got that in there, that may help you deselect compounds. Yeah, we could say it was presented at one of our meetings. We can actually compile that yeah. data set for you and share it again. Uh, 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 Sorry, maybe I missed it. Maybe I missed it. But, uh, at what point would you do in the salt uh, formulate and form screen? Because it seems like you'd want to do that before the uh, dose escalation PK. You want to know exactly. Minute, what so that, that'll be in subsequent slides. Yeah, that's, a, that's covered by the pharmaceutics discipline later on. Okay. Um, I have a quick question. Like when, when you do the uh, brain. Binding, uh, you do you take the whole brain homogenate uh, for the binding assay? Yes, yes. That's okay. what you so we take a, we, take a, we would have control homogenate, and we would spike that in to get an idea of likely brain tissue binding. And I've I've used this on a lot of projects. There's a, a lot of public. I mean, Pfizer sort of drove this when they they industrialized plasma protein binding into a 96 volt format. And when I was at GSK in neurosciences, we we adopted that method and we converted it to brain binding. And we did a lot okay. of work in-house looking at microdialysis versus an in vitro binding assessment. And we, we, we had confidence that a total brain level adapted or adjusted for brain tissue binding was a, a good enough estimation of unbound brain levels for what we needed in the sort of discovery phase before you start going to pet ligands, display, you know, cold ligand displacement or hot pet ligands and things like that. I've worked on those types of strategies as well before. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? If not, we move on to the next section. Oops. So next is safety assessment. So this is Pete Gaskin, colleague from Charles River. Okay. Um, so the, what we've uh, included here is a, a slide on the pre-candidate selection safety assessment and then the next slide just covers what would typically be required for an IND enabling program for the molecules for this type of indication. Um, so bearing in mind that you have kind of five molecules that you're looking to kind of triage down, we would typically conduct a relatively short-term dose range finding study in, in rodents, so normally in rats as Mike suggested, um, just to, to rank the molecules um, as part of that realizing process. Um, maybe, you know, this would come after we've got some data from the probe studies and that would drive the number of molecules that we would put into that study design. We keep it as, as lean as possible, so no histopath, it's just essentially clinical observations, um, body weights, just fairly standard stuff. I understand that there there is some 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 Herg signal in some of the molecules, um, but Herg assays, as you know, do often produce false positive results. Um, so if we find that we can't design out those Herg liabilities within the, the the lead molecules, there is an option for us to to use a sipper type panel to to de-risk um, molecules in vitro. So our facility in Cleveland in Ohio has a SIPA panel set up. This is, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with this, but this is a, an approach that industry is discussing with FDA, um, whereby we have a number of um, um, cardiovascular ion channels um, transfected into cell lines in vitro, and we can test uh, molecules in that in vitro situation and also in a um, uh, an iPSC derived cardiomyocyte. So there's there's a couple of different options there, but certainly you know we can look at um, the five main cardiac channels: so CAV 1.2, NAV 1.5, HERG, uh, KV 7.1, and CUR 
2.1. Um, and I think the you know the, the the logic behind that is that you know HERG risk is mitigated by compensatory CAV 1.2 and now 1.5 block. So it allows you to to look at the iron channels individually and then in the IPSC derived cardiomyocyte to look with in a cell system where you have all of the the normal uh, human iron channels present. Um, I think there was some mention in some of the information that we received about toxicity. Um, that's not something that we would normally do for a non-dermal or, or ocular program, unless there was some specific concern about um, the test items absorbing UV light and distributing to the skin or, or likely to distribute to the skin or the eyes. But that's not something that we would typically do. Um, I think some of these items towards the bottom, where we're talking about before IND enabling studies, Mike's talked about in vitro metabolic stability. We would also need a little bit more information about the profiles of the different metabolites in order to confirm the, the rodent and non rodent species that we would use for the toxicology studies. Uh, just a quick question, just on the phototoxicity. Um, yeah. I know uh, in some diseases, there's been some um, uh, requests from the FDA and the regulatory bodies to just look into that uh, as a box tick. Is that the case that people are seeing in oncology, therapeutics? No, no, it's not a, it's not a standard thing unless, unless there's a specific risk. So there's a specific phototoxicity guideline, uh, okay. S, S, ICH S10. Um, and there's a kind of flow chart in that guideline that talks about, you know, does it absorb UV, visible light? Does it does it contribute to the skin, uh, to the eyes? Um, uh, and then, uh, depending on what the results of that are, if you if you think there is a phototox risk, then the first assay that you would do would be an in vitro uh, neutral red uptake assay. So we, that's something we can obviously do if we need it, but. It's not normally part of a standard screen. Test. Okay, thanks. Just uh, um, another question with respect to yeah. uh, cardiovascular uh, de-risking. Um, before going to um, telemetry studies in, in animals, uh, what, what is, uh, do you have experience using the uh, rabbit wedge? Uh, we we do have experience with uh, a number of different models, such as the Bakinji fiber model, for example. Um, I think we have experience with the the rabbit wedge. Was there a specific reason why you thought that that model would be suitable? Uh, no, just uh, you know, it used to be uh, where where I uh, was before at, at GSK um, that uh, before going to you know whole animal telemetry that 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 was done to hopefully. Uh, uh, avoid it <laughs> if we could yeah 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 i mean there are, there are there are some some advantages to that assay um you know when, when we were kind of talking about this we, we weren't well, I, I wasn't quite sure exactly how many molecules that you were going to be kind of triaging um and certainly you know the advantage of the sipper assay is it, it's a higher throughput assay than, than than rabbit wedge would be um but if you know we were talking about smaller numbers of molecules and just trying to de-risk between you know Two or three molecules, then you know we, we might want to look at some other assays. Right. No. 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 No question. I, I think you know having a, the the CIPA would be great. I just wondered if there was still a signal from CIPA whether there is any value in, in, in doing a rabbit wedge before uh, doing. Yeah. In in my experience, people seem to be you know although CIPA hasn't been fully adopted by FDA, you know we are getting clients who are using this approach and are are seeing it as you know pretty useful, particularly the data from the um, the IPI, IPSC derived cardiomyocyte because it's got all of the channels present there. So, you know, you've got a lot of crosstalk between those channels. So, you know, that seems to be a good predictor. And, you know, the mechanistic information that you get out from the individualized channels as well um, really helps people to understand what's going on. Got it. Thank you. Okay, we, we talked a little bit about formulation suitability for, for, for the in vivo studies. That, that's one thing that we, we often kind of run aground on. Um, 
and Mike kind of made the point about using um, a formulation which is going to be suitable for the toxicology studies because of course we're going to be using much higher dose levels than you've used in any of the efficacy work that you've done uh, before the you know we get into the safety assessment studies um, and also critically we want to use the the same physical form that's going to be used going forward because you know, if you're using a micronized form in your clinical formulation and we don't have a micronized form for example or we've got a different salt form or a co-crystal or whatever it might be we want to make sure that any of the in vivo work that we we do uses that same um physical form of the drug to make sure that you know we're we're predicting um, um toxicity and, and exposure that we're going to be getting in the animals um kind of going forward um again the test item manufacturer scale up was really just a kind of reminder to think about the the amounts of material that um, that are needed for toxicology studies. You know, I know in in discovery you're talking about milligram quantities. Typically, in for toxicology programs, we're talking about hundreds of grams of material. And sometimes, depending on a, you know, if you have a molecule that's very very clean, you know, potentially kilo. Uh, amounts of test items so it's just something that to to bear in mind when you're talking about scale up once we've kind of triaged down the molecules then we would typically conduct um, a non-glp um, uh, single dose and a dose escalating uh, mtd studies in rodent and non-rodent and you know obviously it's critical that we use that that api form and formulation for that specific study in particular. And uh, you touched upon it earlier, you know, of course, in some screening programs where there's a molecule that we just can't design um, a cardiovascular risk out, out of, um, there is the potential to include a, um, a non-rodent cardiovascular telemetry study as part of the screening package. You know, that's kind of the, the last resort in a way um, but you know we we do uh, work on a number of programs where where we do actually involve um, cardiovascular telemetry studies. As as CIPA becomes more and more popular, and and um, I I can see you know that the number of these studies reducing quite significantly. Um, okay, so any last questions on the kind of pre candidate selection safety assessment? No, it okay. looks good. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay, move on to the next slide then. Sue or Angela, thanks. Um, okay, so for the IND enabling program, um, I've assumed that we will be following the ICH S9 guidance. So that specifically states that the, the drug will be used in patients with advanced or late stage cancer. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the current thinking. However, um, th we do want to have some conversations with the regulatory body uh, around that. But let's let's go on that assumption for now. Okay. That is first first in man will be in uh, uh, sick patients. Okay. Okay. And don't I just one other thing. This is a this is a pediatric drug, so the patients are actually you know under twelve. Um. Okay, so so typically, what we'd require for for IND enabling for uh, an S9 program um, is uh, repeat dose tox in a rodent and a non-rodent species, um, typically rat and dog, but that will be driven by the in vitro metabolic data that we get, um, and we build in the safety pharmacology endpoints into those toxicology studies. So we build in the Irwin assessment and respiratory function assessments typically into the, the rodent study and then in the non-rodent study we would include cardiovascular assessments and we have a couple of different options for you know how, how we deal with that and the which option we choose will be driven by any information that we have from the in vitro studies um, on cardiovascular liabilities assuming that the the molecules look clean then we typically go for what we call a snapshot um, lead to ECG assessment, um, but if it's looking like there may be some some more extensive cardiovascular liabilities or there's some signal there, 
then we can include um, jacketed external telemetry or we're increasingly using um, actual implants in toxicology studies so we get uh, even more detailed data on, on moving animals. Um, genotox would not be required um, and just a reminder as I'm sure you're aware that dosing in the clinic beyond the duration of the repeat dose tox studies should be possible if you're going to do those advanced or late stage patients. That's going to be an interesting question about what Owen just mentioned. Most of the compounds that have gone into DIPT clinical trials have actually gone through um, typical adult development talks for some other indication and then get repurposed. I'm wondering if we have to go down the same path, treat it like an adult, or would the FDA actually allow us to actually go via a different path because it's pediatric and you know, that's going to be an interesting. That's a very good question. Um, uh, Peter, I don't know if you want to put your thoughts forward about uh, the more recent uh, conversations and experiences you've had with the FDA. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a question that we, in fact, I was on a call with another client earlier and she was asking me a similar question about another indication. Um, so it really depends or the responses from the FDA seem to depend on on exactly two things. Well, one, what the age of the patients is, um, and secondly, whether there are adult patients as well as 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 um, pediatric patients. So, um, what we've seen from from the regulators is that they are willing to consider the use of younger animals. Um, in toxicology studies, particularly where the indication is going to be um, exclusively or almost exclusively pediatric. Whereas if the indication is likely to be pediatrics uh, and adults, then they tend to more commonly favour um, using adult animals and, and, and adding on a juvenile toxicology study. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this, this is Peter. So, um, no, these are all great uh, questions and considerations uh, right now, and, and certainly I think we should have a session at the appropriate time you know, with FDA, and, and I've, I've actually had these types of discussions with them before with other compounds. Uh, in, indeed, there, there is um, much more flexibility, at FDA, especially when one is going into you know, rare diseases and very children. Um, yeah, I, I think the comments uh, made in terms of the traditional path of going into adults uh, in the clinic and, and thus uh, doing uh, studies in you know, you, know, you know typical animals and then doing juvenile talks as well. Um, I, I, I think we don't need to plan for that in, in this particular case. But again, um, you know, let, let's have the discussion with the, the FDA at the appropriate time and I, I, I do think that they will have a uh, um, a pathetic year in this case. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would um, be surprised. I mean, I, I've always found them very you know, sensible, very pragmatic, and you know, they're, they're, they're there to try to help drugs, you know, get safely into the clinic. So, um, and you know, we, we would be, well, I would be happy to, you know, if you're thinking about questions for your briefing, I'd be, I'd be happy to kind of review those. And, and add my own thoughts into how to face this question. A more practical question then, I mean, the fact that we are thinking of a pediatric population, do we still continue down the tox road where we actually use more adult animals or you end up shifting your tox towards more, um, you know, premature, like younger, yeah, yeah. younger juvenile animal for your talk. So you do you just do the typical more adult road and talk screens. Would that influence your um I, I you think know. the guidelines the uh, state you need to do the juvenile uh, animals, but uh, I'll leave it to uh, um, the others on the phone is to, to add their thoughts, but I'm pretty sure we need that. Yeah, but that's I, I think we need to think about juvenile tox at a certain point, but for uh, first in human, especially given this population, 
Um, I, I, I would favor at least now just planning, of course, we're not there yet, but planning for um, just the, the you know, typical uh, adult uh, uh, animal uh, species. Um, mm -hmm. But we can see. Yeah, I mean, it's always the case that we, we build the safety assessment program to, to support your planned clinical studies. So if your first in human clinical study is going to be in adults, then we would typically uh, conduct the, the toxicology studies in, in adult animals. And then later down the line, if you're going into a pediatric clinical trial, then, then we would you know, run a, um, a juvenile toxicology study to support that. It's only, you know, if you're going straight into juvenile patients in your first in human clinical trial that you know, we would then need to consider whether to conduct those toxicology studies in the environment. I mean, what are, the, what are the risks with the triaging process then? What if we end up filtering out the compound based on tox of adult animals when it actually had a better juvenile yeah. profile? Yeah, but it's one of the risks actually we got to deal with going forward. <laughs> I think more the more likely case, to be honest, is that you, you might filter out um, compounds, um, uh, more compounds in juvenile tox than in, in adults, yeah. uh, you know, because yes, of uh, yeah. the and so forth. <clears throat> but anyway, I, I, I think it's a good consideration to have, and, and you know, uh, probably the earlier we have some even informal with, uh, with uh, regulators, the better. I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Keep going. So, I, um, so just um, to touch on your point earlier, if you, if you do um, change approach and go into patients who are having a, a longer life expectancy, then obviously this program will change whereby the toxicology studies would be standalone toxicology studies. Um, and those safety pharmacology studies would be pulled out as separate standalone studies. So there'd be a separate Irwin, separate respiratory, cardiovascular study, and a HERG assay. And also you would need to do some genotoxic assessments as well. I should, I should also say that to support the, the toxicology studies, we would, of course, need to develop and validate, to, to, sorry, develop and validate formulation analytical methods. In the top study and also bioanalytical methods because these studies will include um, toxicogenetic assessments. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's it. Uh, if I remember rightly, I think I just had those two slides. Um, so okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Next one is um, so, uh, so Andy Carr is Andy with you, Sue? Yeah. Hi everyone. So I'll, I'll take you through the, the pharmaceutical aspects uh, of, of the plan uh, as it stands. I tend to break this down into, into two parts. So the first part that you can see here is, is really aimed at profiling multiple compounds in parallel. So this is an approach we like to take. We, we call it a de-risking approach and we like to take this during probably the last few months of lead optimization so we can provide uh, information on several of the you know potential candidate compounds uh, with a view to de-risking them for, for subsequent development. So you can see a typical cascade here in the, and this has been designed to get maximum information from a minimum amount of material. So it's not meant to be exhaustive, what it's meant to be is a quick look at uh, some of the developability information uh, that we can use to support candidate nomination. So a lot of this cascade uh, is centered around finding a suitable solid dosage form. And see here, we typically start with around 200 milligrams of compound, more of it's available, but 200 milligrams is plenty. Uh, we'll characterize the material we've got already. And at this stage, we're interested in knowing, uh, is it crystalline? Uh, is it thermally stable? Uh, does it contain anything volatile? And that's what those three techniques uh, listed there will do. Uh, we'll then input that material into a crystallization screen. So if we're starting with non-crystalline material, this gives us our first chance of, of isolating crystalline material, uh, which will be used in, uh, in subsequent studies, as, as Mike and Peter uh, have described. Uh, we'll then invest the rest of that material in scaling up the form uh, that we've found. 
and then importantly, we'll get some really useful developability information out of that. So uh, we'll use about 30 milligrams of that for, for full characterization. So we'll check crystallinity, crystal form, uh, thermal stability, uh, hygroscopicity, potential, potentially particle size if we think that's important. Uh, and then very importantly, we can check uh, solubility and stability. Uh, is, this, is, this, is, is this all on base, or you would have actually identified us all that you'll be doing that type of studies on? Do you do us all on screen? So it really depends on, on the compounds. So part, part, of the, part of the utility of this cascade, and my colleague Darren will come on to this in a minute, is working out whether salt formation is A, necessary, uh, and B, desirable. So what we typically do is do this on the free base, and it would give us some information on the developability of the free base itself, uh, but also would flag uh, whether we think salt formation is going to be a useful approach to, to addressing any shortcomings. So we'll, we'll touch on that probably in a couple of slides' time, I think. Okay, so, thanks. Uh, importantly, one of the key readouts you get here is, is a, what we call a proper thermodynamic solubility for the first time. So you can't really get a proper solubility unless you, you're starting with crystalline material. So what we'll be able to do here is rank uh, compounds uh, <coughs> with their dissolution behavior, typically in simulated gastric fluid for an orally dose drug. And we'd probably look at solubility in intestinal uh, fluids as well uh, for that comparison. So uh, I'll show you a typical output from this package in a, uh, on the next slide. But you can see the things that we're trying to de-risk here. Can, can we crystallize the material? And then does that crystal form have the right properties? So this is an example of where we've compared three compounds using this method. These are all pretty active compounds. These were all potential leads in the, in the program we were working on at the time. Uh, what you can see is we've traffic lighted them as to as to various properties that we've that we've found. So what you can see here is compound C is all green, which is excellent. And compound C was was the compound we went with here. There's various uh, liabilities associated with compound A and compound B. Some of these we can mitigate. Some of them are perhaps intrinsic to the material, so we'd want to avoid. So what you can see for all of these, we we crystallised them. We saw multiple crystalline forms of compound A. So that's not necessarily a problem. We could work out the right one for development, uh, make sure we can reliably make it. Uh, but B and C, we only saw one form, so it was more complicated than that. Uh, in each of the cases, we, we had an anhydrous form, uh, which is good, less complications with, with an anhydrous form. For this particular program, it was going to be dosed uh, by inhalation. So these guys were very uh, focused on solubility in a saline-based nebulization vehicle. And what we found is that with compound A and B, we just couldn't get the required levels of solubility. So B was borderline. We were looking at about two to three mg per mil, uh, but compound C was good in that regard. Interestingly, compound A and compound B both showed some instability. So compound A showed some solution phase instability. So even a relatively small amount we could get into the saline formulations uh, was degrading over you know, a, a not too long time frame. So we thought that was problematic. Compound B showed some physical instability. So uh, as part of this, we'll expose your compound to, to moisture. Uh, compound B actually deliquesced. So that was a flag that uh, that compound was significantly more hygroscopic. Uh, and we, we didn't really want to be working with that. Uh, compound C came out green on all of these. So what you can see is this approach in a relatively short period of time, uh, typically about four weeks, about 200 megs of compound. You can compare anywhere between three and five compounds uh, and get a good idea early of their development characteristics. Another element of this is, uh, is what we call uh, a DCS classification. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, my colleague Darren can, can take you through this. Hi, everyone. Uh, so basically what I want to introduce you today is the developability classification system. And um, what this is effectively is, is a, a de-risking strategy for potential APIs. Um, so you can screen four or five APIs against each other, and you can start to look at the barriers to actual bioavailability. So we've heard a lot in the previous presentations about dose escalation and looking at suitable vehicles that you would like to take forward for safety and tox trials. It's using this model that will give you an indication of A, whether or not which candidate is the best in terms of trying to get bioavailability from an oral group, 
and B, what formulation approach you're going to go use. So this process or tool sort of spun out of the biopharmaceutics classification system, um, sort of introduced to the literature about 2010. And what it aims to do is class the drugs into five different categories based on their permeability and the solubility in biorelevant media. So to perform this assessment, it's quite a quick and simple assessment. I just need the thermodynamic solubility in um, FASIV and in vitro permeability data. Typically, we use CACO2 here to actually get that data. I can then plot that information into the matrix you see on the right, and that will then give me a classification. Um, and as you can see, majority of the classes are very similar to the biopharmaceutics classification system. So we have class ones, which are the high solubility, high permeability drugs. These particular drugs, we would have no issues around um, looking at sort of formulation. We wouldn't be that concerned. Um, and so maybe just a small amount of micronization, particle size control would do the job. Then you go into the class two. Now in the BCS, this is just class two, which is sparingly soluble, uh, highly permeable. What's happened with the D DCS is it's actually classed this into two categories based on certain properties. So you have the class 2A, which is dissolution rate limited. So with these particular drugs, you can actually get enough in solution, but you can't get it in quick enough. So you have to manipulate the dissolution rate of your drug in the, in, in the intestine so that you get the, the dose dissolved in time. Typical approaches to doing this would be sort of particle size reduction. So the model will sort of give you a typical particle, a, a suggested particle size range that you could micronize your material to, to get that. Or this is also where your salt formulation might actually come in to help here to actually increase that dissolution rate of your drug, especially if you're working with a weekly basic drug, uh, weekly acidic drug, sorry. Then you have the class 2B drugs. These drugs are solubility limited. So it's these particular drugs where actually then sort of the difficulties start to come into actually the formulation. Um, in, in these instances, micronization and salt formation will not really be suitable approaches to actually getting suitable bioavailability. Uh, in micronization, you won't get enough, you know, you can increase that dissolution rate, but you won't actually get enough to dissolve in the time required. And with salt formations, what tends to happen is you're just adding excess uh, molecular weight baggage and all that will happen pretty much in vivo is disproportionation of your salt, forming that free base and um, that neutral species, which will then precipitate out very rapidly from solution. So typically for these approaches, we need to be looking at sort of amorphous solid dispersions, um, lipid-based formulations, sort of SEDs and SMEDs, um, those sort of approaches, or if they really are a high dose sort of situation, you'd be looking at um, sort of nanoparticles, so sort of nano suspensions to actually gain sort of the increased bioavailability. The diagonal line you see across that box does actually have a use. It is known as the solubility limited absorption. So it's at that point, we can actually work out the dose on that line. So where that line crosses with the absorptions, we can work out the actual dose at which we will start to get to being solubility limited. So, you know, if I have the data, I can then work out what, what dose it is solubility limited. This information with that, that dose, the classification that would come out of it, and coupled with the data that Mike would pull together from his DMP case studies can be a very, very powerful tool to actually selecting very easily what APIs could actually go forward. So if you like saying at the beginning of this talk, you had five APIs and you want to bring it down to two or three, using this in conjunction with the DMPK approach would actually be a great approach to actually start screening down your active ingredients. What I do want to just get across is if it did come in and everything was a class 2B, it's not necessarily the end of the, it's nowhere near the end of the world. It just means we have to actually think about how we're going to formulate the product. Um, so when we go into the safety trials, we're giving them a suitable formulation approach, so suitable formulation that they can use and use for dose escalation with some level of confidence that we will get enough in solution for them. Um, so yeah, and also on top of this, we, 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 it has been refined further and further models have actually been born out of this and we can sort of offer further dissolution studies 
so we can actually understand, especially if your drug is a weekly basic or a basic drug, where you get some rapid dissolution in, this, in the stomach, what will then happen is you can go into the intestine and you will get some precipitation occurring. It will precipitate in the intestine, which is what inhibits bioavailability. But what we can look at is how well it actually holds supersaturation. And in some instances, this can actually lead to a reclassification of the drug. So if we had a 2B, we can actually move that to a 2A. Um, so they, it can actually help looking at the, sort of the dynamic situation of dissolution as well. I know this is a lot to digest, so I can actually provide further information uh, offline from this to actually just go through it. Yep. So, so everything that myself and Darren have discussed up till now is aimed at profiling multiple compounds in parallel with the view to selecting the ones that are least risky to take forward. So I've got uh, another slide that, that, that talks about what we do on a development candidate, but this is just perhaps a good place to pause and see if anyone has any questions about anything we've covered. Okay, there's a question here, sorry. Uh, I have a question because, like, let's see we have uh, an active metabolite that is more than 10%, one of these compounds. Uh, it's active on ARC2. So what the FDA requires now, I know before that they were requiring uh, uh, toxicology studies to be done on the active metabolite. If it's a major comp component. So I'm probably not best placed to answer that, so it might be, might be a conversation that's better directed to our uh, safety assessment colleagues. Sorry, okay, could I just answer that, sorry. Pete, Pete, Pete's still online. there. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I, I just um, could you re reiterate that question? Sorry. Yeah, if we have a major active metabolite, like a 20, 30 uh, percent present, and it's active on ARC2, um, what are the uh, FDA requirements in terms of that uh, metabolite, characterizing that metabolite in terms of toxicology? So, so clearly what we're looking for uh, when we do that in vitro metabolic profiling is to, to ensure that the toxicology species that we, we use um, produce any, any metabolites that are present in humans. So the idea is that we're actually qualifying that metabolite as part of the toxicology studies with, the, with treatment with the, the parent compound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't need to do a separate study as long as it's covered. Okay. okay. Next slide. Okay. Any, was there any further questions about the, the pharmaceutics profiling of, of the compounds before we move on? Or is everyone okay with that? Yeah, most it was okay. So would, would you recommend, some, from what I've seen, you do quite a bit of analysis on the free base before you make salt decisions or do you do salt screening first, and then if the salts are unviable, then you go back to the free base? I mean, is there a kind of a process? I would recommend working with the free base to start with, um, because it, if it comes out as a class 2B drug, then use, formulating a salt for the purpose of bioavailability is absolutely a, 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 you know, for want of a better term, a pointless task. Um, mm -hmm. If you have issues around stability of your drug flow, compressibility, all those other things that you might think the salt might help and stability, mm -hmm. then actually a salt would be an ideal thing. So I would argue that this classification and the work that Andy detailed about crystallization should all be performed prior to doing salt screening to see whether or not you actually require a salt to start with. Yeah. The, the general principle is you need a good reason to want to develop a salt over the free base. So, you know, it's an extra synthetic step, you're adding extra mass, so, you, so your dosage goes up. So you need a good reason to, to develop a salt over the free base. Uh, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot, or Darren's talked a lot about what happens when you dose it, so in terms of dissolution rate. So that's often a driver for, for wanting to use a, a salt. But as Darren said, it's only really useful for those class 2A dissolution limited compounds. There's other reasons for potentially wanting to use a salt, which, which might relate to stability. So if you've got, if it's impossible to find a nice stable form of the free base, for example, uh, then it can be useful to, to go over salts. That might be another flag for that. And you do, we do see compounds quite frequently that are more stable as a salt form than, than they are as free base. But in general, before embarking on a salt screening study, 
you want to understand would that be a useful approach uh, and this first uh, study that we've just gone through here is aimed at looking at those five six compounds in parallel uh, and deciding whether a they're good enough as they are the three base or whether a salt screening approach would be suitable thank you uh, a quick question is there a case when uh, where you would also consider a spray dried formulation uh, as well. Yes, that, that would be one. Of, if it came out as a class 2B and the dose was suitable, that is an approach that I would recommend. Yes, uh, sort of a spray dry with a polymer such as PVP, HPMC or HPMCAS um, or Soluplus um, if we were going to go down the hot melt route. Um, but that is the approach that we could do. Um, we have access to being able to spray dry down to sort of quantities of tens of, of milligrams. So it, it's and having quite a good yield on that. So it's it's something we could do with quite a small amount of material as a screen if we had to do that. Yeah. So again, again it's, something that, it's something that we want to flag at this early stage. Because if you've got you know, a range of compounds, we look at some of them and we think they'd need a specialist technique like spray drying, and we look at other ones and they're much better, then all things being equal, you'd prefer to, to go with the ones that are going to be simpler to formulate. Uh, and looking early at this stage is, is the first glimpse you can get at that information. So uh, we can do all those formulations. We can do loads of fancy things to get stuff formulated and in. But similar to the salt screen, if you can avoid it, then you should because it's you know it's adding extra complications that potentially you don't need if you've got other compounds that, that are better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If it's soluble enough, you could potentially go down API in a capsule and exploit the um, if you can find something that inhibits precipitation in the intestine, you could just go with API, maybe some PVP or something with it, and put that into a capsule for your, your human trials in your early stage. Yeah. Hey, hey, I'm sorry, this is Peter. Just one thing. I mean, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that we'd be going straight into um, uh, children who have um, you know, DIPG here. So, you know, at that age, um, I think, you know, having a, a, a capsule, um, you know, really isn't going to work very well. So um, we'll have to think about, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, of uh, you know, liquid form, you know, e even a suspension, um, if that's the case. So, and yeah, case, that, that's, you know, taste masking may also be something to be considered. Yeah, I mean, it's an approach we could look into is a liquid. I, I've had quite a lot of uh, experience of making suspensions in my time, so it is, it is an approach that could be used. Um, so you could look into, say, a lipid-based formulation, um, which, or a, um, a simple kind of suspension. You know, it could be something we look into the sort of nano suspension range if they are particularly insoluble. Um, so it is, it is an approach. Yeah, there are approaches for that. And I mean, I think the key thing is that all these approaches stem from the fundamental properties of uh, the molecule itself in, in whichever solid form we're going to develop. So uh, the cascade you've seen up till now is really aimed at giving that first early look at compounds whilst we still com can compare them uh, and select one against the other. So if you move, move on to the next slide. So this is, a, this is a much more extensive package, and this is aimed at really fully understanding uh, one development candidate. So what you can see here is the material requirements go up a lot. So rather than hundreds of milligrams, we're looking at grams. Uh, and these are much more intense studies. And this is why you'd normally only want to do these on one compound. So what these typically do is build on the information that we've already got from the early pharmaceutics package uh, and builds a lot more confidence uh, in the solid form of the material. So typically, we'd, we'd do a full polymorph screen. So this is a much more extensive study, typically taking uh, between six and eight weeks. Uh, we do a much more thorough investigation of the polymorphic landscape. So uh, as well as understanding any anhydrous forms, we'd look for hydrated forms, uh, which might form on dosing or might form on storage. We'd also look for uh, solvated forms, and this ties into to manufacturing. So if we know we get solvated forms, we need to avoid those solvents for, uh, for the last stage processes. So it gives you a whole world of information. Uh, and it aims to be as exhaustive as possible in characterizing all the solid forms of the material. Uh, and I know uh, earlier when, when Pete was talking and when Mike were talking, we're talking about how early do you want to settle on the, the correct solid form for your material? And the answer is always as early as feasible. 
uh, but obviously there's always constraints on, on material uh, and time and money on the programs. So this is a good stage to start looking at it, not least because it will tie in uh, with manufacturing and, and preparing, you know, 10 to 100 grams of material that you're going to need for those uh, tox DRS studies. Yeah, and uh, if I could just so, oh, sorry. sorry, if I can just add sorry. in there, if if we're doing those, you know, the the rodent dose range finding study that I mentioned, where you're going to include a number of test items uh, and try to use that information to rank them, clearly. Um, understanding about the, the the bioavailability of those different forms is going to be useful because it may be that it's not the safety liabilities that are driving the um, the, the ranking but actually the the bioavailability so if we if we know that we're using a form that, that where we have good bioavailability that takes that that complicating factor out of interpreting that, that data yeah I mean it, it's a really good point I mean it's Often we get involved in, in discussing discrepancies between compounds and sometimes between different batches of the same compound where we're seeing results we weren't expecting. And one of, one of the common causes for that is that for one compound or the first batch of a particular compound, we're dosing amorphous material, which is really fast dissolving. Uh, and then subsequent batches uh, we make on larger scale and uh, those materials crystallize on isolation. So we're dosing crystalline material. Uh, and you see vast differences often in the bioavailability of those two. So it's important to, to separate out, uh, as Pete was saying, as well as, well as from the for, as well as from the tox aspects, also the, the efficacy uh, aspects. Being able to understand the solid form lets you do true true comparisons of molecules. So you're comparing apples with apples in terms of efficacy. And you're not comparing an amorphous dose of one with a crystalline dose of the other, uh, and consequently get you know getting data that's misleading. So coupled with uh, the polymorph screening, it's often a stage at which we do salt screening. And in fact, if we know we want a salt from, from the DCS classification, uh, we typically do the salt screening first and then do the polymorph screening on the salt. So uh, dosing orally, you've got quite a range of uh, counter ions uh, that you can use. Uh, so no restrictions on that. Uh, typically, five grams for salt screening, five grams for polymorph screening. You're looking at about eight weeks work uh, for each of those. And the output from those studies is really a lot of confidence in the form that you're going to develop, both from a uh, stability point of view and from a performance point of view, uh, and also an eye to be able to reliably make those. Uh, and that ties in with the, the next step you can see here, which is crystallization development. Uh, and this is aimed at developing a, a nicely robust and scalable crystallization procedure. So once you know which solid form you want, you want to be able to make it. And sometimes this can be really trivial. If there's only one polymorph, then uh, you've got a wide range of uh, options for crystallization, and uh, it can be a relatively straightforward process. If you've got a lot of different polymorphs, uh, and if you've got solvates, hydrates in particular, uh, then it can be challenging sometimes to make sure that the route you use on one gram can transfer to 10 grams and 100 grams in a kilo. So that's why we often look at this crystallization development as as a proper uh, process study uh, that's aimed to be uh, scalable. And then beyond that, when we're, we're able to produce tens to 100 grams of material reliably, and we'll often transfer that knowledge to, uh, to a GMP manufacturer so that they can make that material, uh, we start to look at stability as well. So uh, typically three months stability at this stage, and depending on what we know about the final formulation, we might include particular excipients here, uh, we might include, well, we certainly will include temperature and humidity related conditions to, uh, to monitor stability. Uh, and that often tends to overlap with, with candidate nomination. So uh, because it's a three month study, you know, it takes, takes a relatively long period of time and you can't do it until you know your, your solid dosage form, essentially which solid form you're going to uh, manufacture. So that often is, the, is the, the rate limiting step in this package, which often means it, it pokes out the back of candidate nomination. But before we get to that stage, all the while through the polymorph screening, and in fact, even through that early 200 mega valuation, we're building up confidence in the stability. There's smaller stability packages included in each of those studies so that hopefully by the time we get to the three month study, we don't have any horrible shocks. So I think that's the last slide from me. That's, that's how we recommend approaching the stage of the project you are at the moment from a pharmaceutics point of view. Uh, and as I say, it breaks down into those two packages, really. There's the early package aimed at evaluating multiple compounds in parallel, 
Uh, and then there's the packages you see on the slide here, which are aimed at doing much more robust definitive studies. <laughs> Okay, no, that's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, thanks for providing some nice insights into the development path. I mean, I'm sure it's an education for a lot of people, so we really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. We so, have another couple of slides. Sorry, we've gone massively over time. I realise that we had a couple of slides on the pharmacology, if that's useful. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry, well, okay. Yeah. So this is Liz Anderson, who's uh, an expert pharmacologist in the oncology area. Hi, can you go on to the next slide? Right, I, th I think most of these are already been addressed anyway, particularly the in vitro studies. Um, so the idea of these pharmacolo the pharmacology package is really to demonstrate efficacy and selectivity in the appropriate models, and then understanding the PK-PD efficacy relationships. And that those data will be used in combination with the PK data to ensure that you can uh, achieve enough free drug in, in the patients to, to, to actually get anti-tumor activity. I think target engagement mark, uh, assays are fairly clear. Um, we're already doing the ALP2 Nanobrex assay. Uh, you'd want to look at selectivity versus the other relevant ALKs. And at some point, you'll want to look at selectivity across a wide panel of kinases just to ensure that you don't have any other um, liabilities or uh, activities against other kinases. Um, we would ideally recommend a pharmacodynamic marker, uh, and Methvin has already measured this, uh, mentioned this is the uh, effects on phosphosmads, particularly one, five, or eight, uh, which appear to have some, um, which appear to be modulated by uh, activity at the ALK2 receptor. Um, Efficacy, inhibition of tumor cell growth, and I mean the basic uh, assays there are just two di dimensional assays using that, that should be CTG, which is cell type to go glow as an endpoint, which is just a very simple re uh, readout of, uh, of, of cell number. And we probably want to show, we definitely want to show activity across the spectrum of the uh, DIPG associated ALK2 mutations and possibly including, if we can, the G356D mutation, because that does seem to be um, correlated with a degree of resistance to ALK2 inhibition. And as I, I said uh, earlier, the, uh, the aims of these studies are to understand the relationship between effects on target engagement, pharmacodynamic modulation and proliferation in terms of the IC50s and EC50s. So, what we want to make sure is that we're going to achieve free drug levels in patients that are sufficient to inhibit tumor growth. So if you go on to the next slide, this is just an overview of the in vivo studies. Um, if we can have a model of DIPG that, that can be grown sub-Q rather than, rather than in the ponds or in the brain, then uh, this would make mod looking at the PD marker much easier because you've clearly got access to the tissue. Um, so what we'd like to see is modulation of the PD marker in an in vivo model of, of DIPG. Um, so obviously the most common ones, the R206H mutation, but also look at the other mutations if we have those available. There was some discussion about whether FOP would be an acceptable model in which to demonstrate effects on tissues bearing the R206 mutation. And, and it would also be useful for establishing the PKPD efficacy relations, but this would have to be discussed with the regulatory authorities as to whether this would be a, a suitable in vivo substitute for DIPEG itself. But I think looking at the comments that Methvin made at the uh, beginning of the meeting, that, um, that we will have to look at um, in vivo models of DIPG. In vivo study to support the IND is to confirm the effects of the clinical candidates on the PD marker tumor growth and survival of tumor bearing animals uh, in relevant models of, of DIPG. Uh, and then it, this may come up is investigate the effects of ALP2 inhibitor on indices of bone remodeling because this may come up as a on target effect. So looking at bone density and structure in, in some of these studies. And we could also look at circulating markers of bone turn, should be bone turnover, not bond turnover, um, such as ALP, TRAP, or Cathepsin K. And those could actually form alternative P 
PD markers that, that are much more amenable to, uh, to measurement than going into the tumour. Biomarker development, we'd suggest the availability of a minimally invasive clinical biomarker of efficacy, which would accelerate clinical development. And a couple of suggestions based on some of the reading I've done is just looking at uh, circulating tumour DNA as an indicator of tumour burden. Uh, we may be able to detect the ALT2 or the histone H3 mutations uh, in circulating, uh, circulating uh, free DNA. And we might also be able to detect tumour associated DNA CSF, but as a means of tracking response to uh, treatment, but of course that's um, somewhat more invasive. And the other suggestions that Methvin mentioned would be looking at um, phosphosmab 1, 5, and 8 expression in, in PBMCs from patients. That's a really swift overview of the, of the kind of pharmacology that would, would go into an IND package. Any questions? No, it's very good. Uh, yeah. Just Peter, I have a quick question. And again, I apologize for not knowing a lot of the history. Uh, certainly, uh, a lot of uh, screening against uh, you know, the, the, the kinome or you know, many, many kinases in the kinome would be very important. But has some of that already been done for the five leads that we have? Yep, we screened them across the entire kinome at RBC, almost what? 374 kinases. So we're getting very, very good selectivity. I mean, we hit the AL2 and I think what the, one or two of the other ALKs. And then other than that, we're getting very, very, very good selectivity across the kinome. Mm -hmm. well, that's, good. that's good. One, one of the other things I, I meant to say was that um, I noticed when we were talking about the different uh, newer compounds that are coming out is that um, uh, for the in vivo studies, at some point, you'll want to take two or three of your candidates through the same models to see, to, to do the um, PKPD uh, efficacy studies, because that may be another way of, of um, choosing what compound you take into clinical development. Mm -hmm. Yep. So they still Agreed. go through the same models rather than slightly different ones. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, any other questions? All right, if not, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate this. Uh, okay. Well, it's a couple so, more slides. Really so because we presented a lot of activities, we just we don't need to go through them, but if you just click one more, we, we just put it all into a Gantt chart so that we could kind of list all the activities and show where they might come in time, um, which is mm -hmm. a reference for the project team to go to after the meeting, I think. But um, we've grouped them into the ones that you could use to triage, in yellow, those that would be useful or needed in a single compound once you've chosen one to, to achieve a candidate nomination, and then those in red, which you go on to profile in the IND package. So that's just really a summary. And then on the next slide, just the, the key things that we think we should start with in terms of triaging the compounds, of which um, we already have, and, and we, it's just filling in this label for the five compounds would be our recommendation. We don't need to discuss that. It's really just a summary of in this. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Nicole and team. Yeah, serious. That, that was um, that was a fantastic presentation. I know it took a little bit longer than maybe you thought, but I think it was really worthwhile. Yeah. I think it really wor walked through it. And in fact, one of the things I enjoyed was it also gave us a recap about some of the things that we've done to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this we're going to use. Uh, this document uh, kind of as a replacement for the old document I circulated around it, it's, um, in discussions with NIH and others moving forward just to let you know if people have comments, want to add to it, or thoughts, uh, we'll probably uh, reformat it into something that's easier to comment on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whole team over there, Charles River, this has been above and beyond and a fantastic and thoughtful process. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let's running a little behind schedule. So let's come up to speed. Uh, so up next is um, Sue, giving a brief update of some of the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Okay. Hi there. So I'll try and go through this fairly quickly. Obviously, um, I'm very aware of the time. I want to leave time for the the in vivo models, particularly. 
So just uh, we're continuing at the moment to work on analogs around the two blueprint patents. Uh, we've not done any new protac work at the moment because I think we need to work out a bit more on the biology front, um, and uh, we'll we'll have some more internal discussions and discussions with uh, the guys at Oxford about the sort of next steps for that. Um, Is there anything we can do to help organize that? Do, would you like us to help try to organize? Uh, I know Alex is on the line. Maybe we can help organize something. Let me know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to continue on. Um, we're working with an AI company to try and see if there are any compounds within the 2009 series that may have selectivity over the other ALKs that we don't routinely screen against. Uh, at the moment, we've not made any significant progress, but uh, hopefully some of the compounds coming through may, be, may provide some other interesting analogues with different profiles. And also, we've been working, so Sylvia has been working with Lisa and with uh, the guys at Oxford um, on the, the fragment screening and how we're going to try and work that up. So that's just a general update. So let's go on to the next slide. I think this is just my routine starting slide. So M4K3007, so this is a series, so this is a compound from Blueprint, the blueprint series uh, that we're, uh, we're working on to try and um, improve the property. So this compound is very active, uh, reasonably selective, um, but unfortunately in the PK study it had really poor uh, CNS penetration. We believe that's probably down to a combination of molecular weight and the, P the PKA. So our current aims are trying to improve those properties while maintaining potency and selectivity. So next slide, please. This is just a reminder of, la of where we've got to. And I think we've made some quite significant progress going from M4K uh, 3007 which had a, a brain to plasma ratio of around 0.15 to 0.2. Uh, the best compound we've got now, slightly less active, is M4K 3093, um, which is slightly less active, but 18 nanomolar versus uh, 4 nanomolar. Um, but as you can see on the right hand side, and I think I presented this last time, we, we've now got the brain to plasma ratio up to around close to 0.5. So this is actually better than some of the uh, 2009 series compounds, two of the compounds which have uh, relatively lower brain to plasma ratios. Uh, so I think you know, we've made some significant progress. We'd like to get that uh, higher. Um, but at the moment, that, that's the stage we're at. So if you go on to the next slide, we've got a few recent, com few recent compounds. So we made some compounds where we replaced the top piperazine uh, by alternative groups uh, to see what the impact of that would be on uh, potency and whether they had the potential to provide uh, improved brain, brain to plasma ratio. Um, and you can see that from the, the two piperidine compounds, 3111, um, the three amide was pretty much inactive. The 4-amide did have some potency, but the more interesting compound, as far as I was concerned, was M4K 30, 3114, uh, where the potency is now down at 27 nanomolar in the uh, routine screen. However, from the nanobreath assay, this compound was not particularly active. Um, so it may well be that we've now got an additional H-bond donor. So we're, we're thinking of trying to make the um, N-alkyl compound, which looks from the modeling to be uh, tolerated and hope that removing that H-bond donor may improve the cell permeability. We've just also made the uh, peperidine reverse amide, which also docks really quite nicely and possibly looks more the sort of similar shape to um, the sort of uh, the peperazine carbamates. So it's putting the um, the group a little bit further out. Um, that one will, will be in the next assay when we send the compounds, I think it's next week. So the next slide, please. Um, so we've also uh, started looking a bit more at the, the other way w that we can modulate the um, the activity, oh, sorry, the, the brain to plasma ratio is by changing the tail group. Uh, the majority of of uh, things should be tolerated, um, but 
you know, you have you have to make them to see. So at the moment, because of the synthetic uh, route, we've all, we've made uh, the compounds in the Des Fluoro series, and we're we're making a range of different compounds like uh, MPK3124, um, where we're changing the the tail group, and when we've got all the activities back, we'll look and see which ones look to be the most promising, and then we'll make those with the fluorine attached. Um, we have made the fluoro, corresponding fluoro compound, the one on the previous slide, the M4K 3128, has been made, and that will be screened soon. We've also made a compound with, where we've got a nitrile to see whether that also will give us any benefits in terms of well, activation, activity and um, and permeability. So, next slide, please. Um, so, on the far right-hand side, at the, the bottom of this slide, is M4K3120. So, this is the compound that um, Chung Fu uh, mentioned earlier, uh, which was very potent in the nanobrite assay. So, there's, there's the numbers. So, 13 nanomolar in the ALP2 biochemical assay, but you can see the selectivity has been uh, significantly reduced with that nitrile, the presence of that nitrile. I believe that that probably, as I mentioned earlier, probably sits in a similar position to the um, the nitrile in the M4K 2009 series, where the me the methyl in the in the pyridine on central pyridine uh, sits in the same uh, when that's replaced by nitrile, it sits in the same sort of position. So that was a that was a patented compound, and we're looking to see what else we might be able to think about to uh, to again go outside of the patent. And I think that's probably all my slides. Any questions at all? No, nope. that's fine then. Thank you. Hello? Yep, so sorry. Um, so <laughs> up, next is, up next is Jerome. Jerome is going to walk us through some of the um, animal model studies that he's been doing. That led to one of the publications he had recently. So. Can you uh, toss the mouse? Yeah. 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 When did you last go to Montreal? Uh, almost six years ago now. Oh, it's been a while because you're wearing a coat in this room. <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one. I forgot what well, it's called. I'm crazy. Like. I just have a t-shirt underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Swarmed up a little. I don't know if it's radiation. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Jerome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I was just going to give you a few uh, snapshots about a paper that's in press, and this was uh, a long time coming. This work, and some people on the line contributed to that. Um, Alex, Jung Fu, Ellie, um, and uh, some people are already aware of the of the work as well. Chris Jones, Nada, and, and Michelle, and so and uh, Cynthia also contributed to this study. So. Um, basically, in, in that paper, what we did is we uh, developed uh, knock-in mouse models, trying to model, you know, the IPG. Um, and what we found is that uh, mutant HCVR1, in this case, we modeled a G328D mutation, um, is enough to cause a differentiation arrest of oligodendroglial progenitor cells. And I think this is important because it suggests that that mutation is. Um, an initiating event in the tumor formation, which we already knew, but it drives the fundamental process that if we can reverse that or inhibit that, that could potentially have like a lot of therapeutic benefit. That's kind of the root of the tumor. That's where you want to act. And so we generated a, a, a mouse model that combined these three mutations that are found often together in the, in the IPG and the mice develop brain tumors. They, for that to happen, they need at least HCVR1 and PI3 kinase mutation. The histone is dispensable, but it may modify a little bit the disease. I'm going to show you that. And in the paper, we also characterized this uh, dual uh, MEC HCVR1 inhibitor called E6201, which showed some therapeutic benefits, but it's, it's really not perfect. So there's room to own improvement for these kind of, of, uh, of drugs, of therapeutics. So this is what uh, it looks like in the terms of survival. So it's a spontaneous tumor model. So it is quite variable, uh, and it takes a while, right? So it's about a year me a median um, uh, to endpoint. Um, so it's, it's a 
it's not as uh, easy or straightforward a model as you know, Xenograft, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it's a spontaneous immunocompetent model. And as you can see, you need at least HCVR1 in PI3 kinase, as I mentioned, that's the, that's the purple line. Mm -hmm. um, either one alone, I never saw the, these type of tumors. And the histone may accelerate the tumor, increase the penetrance a little bit, but uh, it's not clear at this point to what extent. So here I'm showing you some examples of the tumors. So it's in some cases, we're kind of lucky, if you will, and you get the, and they're all high-grade diffuse glioma, similar to the pathology, but anatomically, they, they, they differ, right? So here we have a tumor that arose in the brainstem and towards the midbrain. And there's also something in the, in the forebrain here. I don't know if it's the same tumor or two independent tumors. Um, and, 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 but most of the time, we actually get things that are localized in the thalamus and, and going into the forebrain. So again, anatomically, not the perfect model of the human pathology, but they're all high-grade diffuse glioma, similar to the human pathology. So whether it's the interspecies difference or whether it's just the, the model is not optimal or so on, then we still don't know that. Um, I made some cell lines. From, the, from these tumors, and those can be xenografted. So, and actually, they can generate tumors depending on where you inject them. Uh, here, in this case, it was this cell line, I injected it in the brainstem, and it's cut off here, but this is the, the brainstem here, and so the, the tumor arrives there. Here, I targeted the, the injection to more like the thalamus area. They're, they're all high grade diffuse gliomas, but the, um, the Basically, you can generate them anywhere you want in the brain. Now, this is an Im immunocompromised recipient mouse. Mm -hmm. I'm testing now if they can actually be transplanted into an immunocompetent model. Uh, the, so those, are, those, are, those are all uh, those are xenografts. Yeah, they're, those, those are xenografts. Xenograft. Yeah, these two are xenografts. Xenograft. Yeah. So, I, if it's an NFG, I mean, there's, I'm not sure this is more valuable than just like a human DIPG xenograft, like the 007, for example, which is really good. Um, but it could be a complementary model. But if we can get this into an immunocompetent, that could be actually quite nice. And uh, this, the survive, this is much tighter in terms of survival. It's much quicker. Like it's maybe 50, 50 to 70 days mm -hmm. after injection, depending on how many cells you inject. So that could be something that we use as well. Have you tried it up you? Would the cell lines actually go? Oh, I'm just, I haven't tried, but I'm sure they would. If they grow on their brain, they, I'm pretty sure they would grow sub-Q as well. But I don't know. Something to think about. That's, a, that's one of the things Nada is doing. She's trying to yeah. get some of these go under the skin for xenograph because, like as we spoke earlier, we're trying to type to get PD markers and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Right? So if you could do shorter term, yeah, like, yeah. you know, tumor reduction studies, even though it's not the author topic, that would actually be a plus. So it might be worth testing to see if it goes mm -hmm. under the skin. Yeah, I mean, I can I can test it easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, we did some characterization of the tumors, and they pretty much match what you find in humans. So they're, they're high-grade tumors, so they're highly proliferative. They express PDGFRA uniformly oligo 2 positive. Of, we also targeted the mutation to oligo 2 expressing cells. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, at least some areas of the tumors are positive for nestin and GFAP, which are the progenitors marker. And something that's actually not in the paper is recently I performed RNA sequencing analysis of these tumors, and by a gene signature, they match actually the, the human pathology, so a proneural signature, uh, oligodendrocyte progenitor like. And also, they also have features of neural progenitor like, uh, just like we see in the, in the human tumors. Mm -hmm. So, what can we do with this? So, one thing that I'm setting up now, and again, this is, if we're thinking of the June 2020, uh, Outlook, this is not really realistic, but maybe after that or down the line or combining with other therapies. Uh, with STAR, which is located actually in this building, you guys might know about it, we, this is, uh, they have a really nice platform for small animal imaging, like you can do a lot of different things. And we're gonna set up a, a co an exploratory core to see if we can monitor tumor development by MRI. Uh, because of the, the latent sin survival, which is quite variable, then the, the question becomes, if you want to use this immunocompetent spontaneous model to test any drug, when do you start treating? Mm -hmm. and you, you have a mouse that might not get a tumor before a year of age, one might get it at four months old, one might get it at 18 months old, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we hope that with MRI and the, this paper that's now several years old, they, they show that you can do that in mouse models that, that are not identical to that, of course, but like, you know, kind of similar, right? 
So we, anyway, I'll keep you posted on what we see there, if we're able to track early tumor development and so on, and how sensitive and how good it is. And what we could do down the line is administer drugs of interest, and with this MRI monitoring, actually seeing if the tumor shrinks. Hopefully, like that would be the goal here. So, anyway, I'll keep you posted on where we develop there and what you know what what's possible and what's not. When you um, grow the tumor in, in in the mice, at what point do they start to show the same or similar, or do they show similar symptoms as a pediatric patient would? Eye with coordination, with stumbling, with yeah. So, so of course, the, the two, when the mice get terminal, they they have extremely pronounced uh, neurological right. symptoms. Right. Is there anything as a kind of because the, the so the clinical the, problem that yeah. you may be having. And this, these are all unknowns, but just thinking that, that the disease is so far developed by the time uh, symptoms show up that even with a very yeah. good you know, inhibitor of, of L2, it's too late. Yeah, uh, possibly. So the, um, hopefully with MRI we can answer some of those questions. Uh, like, you know, like if we see a lesion appearing and then matching it to the behavior of the animal. What I can also tell you is that just the ACVR1 mutation by itself with adic 2 cre is enough to um, give some uh, uh, motor symptoms mm -hmm. yeah, in, in young mice. Mm -hmm. um, that probably reflects what good endocyte dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, their, kind of their differentiation is impaired and so the myelination is impaired and so. But to, to, to what extent this matches what you see in humans is, a, is an unknown because in this mouse model, you really have all, basically all the cells in the brain that express the two have activated the mutation, which is not what you see in humans. In humans, you have a, a one or a few cells initially that are really localized. So, um, but we can still use this as a, uh, you know, a, a biomarker or something. You oh, know, it's, to, it's fascinating. To it's see fascinating. Whether it's trying to yeah. pull yeah. towards the clinical utility and we'll understand. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that. And then the last slide I have is just something I wanted to show. We started doing this, and I know other people are doing similar things, like uh, probably Nada's group, Chris Jones' group as well. It's, we're, try, we're using now functional genomics to uh, going, uh, uh, you know, uh, after potential new therapeutic liabilities in cancer cells and in the IPG cancer cells. And uh, here I'm showing you an example of something that we've done uh, in Toronto, where we uh, we created a custom CRISPR library targeting about 3,000 uh, druggable genes or pathways um, and, and four guide RNAs per, per, per gene. And then we infect that in the population of, of uh, Cas9 expressing the IPG cells. And then you can top up drugs, the radiation, whatever you want on top of that. These screens are extremely custom, uh, customizable. You let the cells grow, and then after a while, so several cell doublings, you sequence by sequencing, targeted sequencing, you see which guide RNAs are enriched or depleted, and the ones that are depleted are presumably targeted genes that are important for cell fitness. Mm -hmm. And you can also identify maybe genes that are, uh, uh, when you knock them out, it's actually beneficial for the tumor cell. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing you an example here in the DIPG4 line. Again, one caveat important to mention is that this is a single Cas9 expressing clone. Mm -hmm. So we know that these cell lines can be heterogeneous. Chris Jones had a very nice paper on that in Nature Medicine last year or, or two years ago. Um, so, you know, just to keep that in mind. But anyways, the, you, you see as expected dropout of guide RNAs that target essential gene CDK1, and then you can also identify things that might be particularly interesting in the cell line, like mTOR, but that's also kind of like a core fitness gene in many cancer cells. But in this screen, you can see clearly the ACVR1 guides are, are, are not depleted over time. Basically, this suggests that the cell line is not dependent on ACVR1 signaling you know, for fitness at this point, again, in this Cas9 expressing clone. So um, we have other screens that are going on and we'll go on with other cell lines so we can, but hopefully we can use that as well to uh, identify which cell lines are dependent on ACVR1. I mean, again, Chris Jones had uh, shown the IPG007, right, uh, it's, it's dependent on ACVR1. I confirmed that. Uh, the IPG36 is one also uh, where I've seen it's dependent on ACVR1. But that, that was uh, using a targeted uh, knockout or knockdown. Uh, mm -hmm. This is in the context of a screen, right, where you have a mixed cell population. So I think it gives kind of like another perspective mm -hmm. uh, on that as well. Um, 
It doesn't mean the IPG4 is, is useless to, yeah. to test. I mean, we see the IPG4, it, there's what's called SMAD15, and then you put them for a compound that goes away, so you can you can do studies like that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but, but maybe in terms of assessing cell fitness, it might not be the best model. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we wait until about 12 o'clock. So, again, just want to thank everyone for submitting a lot of information to digest. Quite a lot to think about, but at least we have a plan, we have a path. So looking forward to some more updates next month. Okay, thanks everyone.